<laughs> Thank you. Oh my gosh. Um, you know, I, I don't think any of us would be offended if you moved closer. <laughs> if you feel the, the need to, now would be a great moment for a, a kind of chaotic reverse <laughs> diaspora. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, good, thank you for moving down. Yeah, we, we might as well be cozy because we're wonderful. Um, <laughs> um, and I'll just start chatting away while you, while you move. Um, so th thank you, Derek, for that. Um, very, very much. Um, when, um, yeah, this has been a, a while in the coming and I really appreciate it. Derek and I have been trying to find ways to connect for a long time since he was a child at the TCG conferences and I was already old. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, one of the things that I think we've shared um, that is so apparent at this gathering, this extraordinary gathering, is um, a sense of like trying to see through the maps of the theater world that obscure the real map of the theater world. And it's been um, a long-term project and I just have to um, say with huge gratitude and awe, the, uh, looking at the program for these four days it feels like you and the folks here at Georgetown have really broken through that map and, and really, you know, it's like those, those things where you see the Rand McNally and you realize that the United States looks bigger than everything else in the world and you've done that revision around the theater and you've brought the world here and you've brought um, uh, the real change makers and practitioners that are, um, uh, here, so thank you for that, and um, and I'm like a big fanboy over here with this panel because uh, this panel embodies that very thing, and the people here, um, only one of whom is new to me, the others are people I love and admire and worship from a near or afar, and uh, so it's really an extraordinary group, and I think before, I'm gonna do a little preamble, but before I do that, just introduce yourselves, and if you feel like reading what you love, just do that. If you don't, just skip the shit. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, hi. <laughs> we need to use these, because we're live streaming, so we have to, everybody has to be a mic, everybody has to be Elvis oh, oh, great, today. Great, great. Yeah. Is, we've got one. Hi, I'm Tamala Woodard. Um, very nice to be here. I am, uh, I love audiences. Um. <laughs> oh, that okay, one other person <laughs> does too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's, it. That's it. But I, you know, I will. You will find me a perfect match for many of you. Um, I am the associate artistic director of, at WP Theater, formerly Women's Project. Yay. <laughs> There's some lab members in the house. Uh, I am a co-founder of Pop-Up Theatrics, um, which creates immersive theater and um, uh, uh, models of collaboration internationally. And some of our partners are in the house right now. Um, um, uh, Lu Lucia Miranda is there. I'm also here as a really proud representative of On Guard Arts, where I am in collaboration with Annie and Co. and Layla Buck, who's a writer. Have your <laughs> Do we each have our own microphones? I think so. Oh we my do. God. <laughs> wow. so Where it, no college I've ever taught at has. This. Um, hello, y'all. Uh, my name is Mark Valdez, and um, my not so secret uh, secret is that I love musicals. I love them. They're so <laughs> wonderful. Um, and uh, and I'm a, just uh, an artist, theater maker. I'm based in Los Angeles, and I get to travel uh, to wonderful places uh, all over the United States. Hi. Good morning, everyone. My name is Raymond Caldwell. Oh, my name tag isn't here, but it says I love Jasmine Rice. <laughs> it's like, oh. love Jasmine Rice. It's, it's my thing. It's the Filipino in me. It's like, ah, I gotta have it. Um, <laughs> I am the artistic director at Theater Alliance here in Washington, D.C. in Southeast Anacostia. 
Hi, uh, I'm Maria Manuela Goyanes. I'm the Artistic Director of Woolly Mammoth. Uh, so many people here. We could have done this panel like three times over with the amount of heavyweights that are in this room actually looking at us. So it's a little bit, whoa. Um, and uh, I like dulce de leche. Anything with a little bit of caramel on it, I'm in. <laughs> I'm Stephanie Ibarra. I'm the, still the new artistic director at Baltimore Center Stage, uh, and I really love pit bulls, like a lot. <laughs> velvet hippos. Velvet hippos. That's what they're called, velvet hippos. Um, I've never heard that before. Uh, my name is Michael Rode. I'm uh, first really honored to be um, sitting with this group of people and to be in a space with this group of people. So. Really honored to be here. Uh, I'm the artistic director of Sojourn Theater, a 20-year-old ensemble. It's uh, made up of 15 artists who live in seven cities around the US and work collaboratively on different projects. And I'm also the co-founder of something called the Center for Performance and Civic Practice, which describes itself as a national resource for artists and communities working together to build arts-based community-led transformation. And we do capacity building in lots of spaces. And my title there is the lead artist for civic imagination. So thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you, guys. And I echo what Maria said about this group. It's great to see you all here. Um, so I want to just ramble for a few minutes and read something and then turn to the panel. And I really only have one question, which you already know what it is. So you better, you know, step up and talk a lot. Um, the uh, the idea, as Derek talked about for this panel, was really to talk about ancestry and what we carry into the future as we're building a new future. And when I say we, I really mean they, um, because this is, I mean, again, it's another example of the real made visible that these are the leaders of the American theater now, um, among the leaders, among the people in this room. Um, but also the work that this group of people has been doing has redefined the aesthetics of our theater and the ethics of our theater and the justice of our theater and not always been um, visible as the mainstream and now suddenly, uh, as if it happened overnight, uh, it, the mainstream is here. The, um, uh, the person that I'm bringing into this room is uh, a great founder of the American uh, regional theater movement, who's from right here in DC, Zelda Fitchhandler. And one of the things that Zelda has, th this just this little quote, um, which is, uh, progress is a snail that jumps, you know? And my sense of that is that things move so slowly and then suddenly there's a jump, and so I think that's, that's kind of the moment, what this moment feels like for all of the uh, other kinds of weird and heinous jumps that are going on in our culture. There's this beautiful one that, that we're in the midst of. So we wanted to explore, you know, what, what do you carry from the past into the future, and what do you let go of? And one of the things I was reminded of, um, I don't know if Michael will remember this, but a passing conversation we had at a network of ensemble theaters board meeting some years ago, and I said something about how important it was to remember the founding impulses of theaters. And he said something like, yeah, as long as they weren't based in racist, sexist, white supremacist, um, you know, thinking. And so there's this, um, this is, I feel like this kind of defines the terms of this conversation, for at least for me, which is like, what do we look back to and carry forward? And what do we really, are we gonna fight to leave behind and not carry forward or change? I don't know if you remember that moment. You do. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was the third artist that we had that evening. Oh, Jesus, really? <laughs> I would have said we had never argued. I'm really we were arguing. So. We were arguing. Yeah. Jesus. Okay. I enjoyed it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. I love you too. Okay. I love you. Um, so uh, I just want to read something uh, before I turn it over to everybody. And this is also from 
Zelda Fitch Handler. So for those of you who don't know, in 1950, right here in uh, a segregated DC, she founded Arena Stage. Um, and that theater obviously still exists today. She led it for about 40 years. And um, th three times in that, the history of that theater, she tried to tear it down and rebuild it as an, uh, a fully integrated institution. And she, by her own measure, she failed every time. The first time she tried to do it through the acting company, the second time she tried to do it top to bottom, organizational, and the third time I think she was just sort of cheering from the sidelines as she moved, um, moved away. Um, but this is actually from uh, 1968. And she starts this, and I, I should say, I'm currently editing her collected writings and speeches, which she couldn't finish before she died about three years ago. And so uh, I have the great uh, honor and really soul nourishment of going back to it on a sort of daily basis. And it's taking a long time, because there's a lot there, and she was an amazing thinker and writer. Um, so I'm going to read this. It's going to take a couple minutes, and then I'm going to shut up and turn to you guys. Um, so this is 1968, and one of the things she's describing is something that the art critic Harold Rosenberg talks about in terms of our ability to see what's happening in visual art. And he uses this example from the Revolutionary War, a moment where the British redcoats were marching through the forest, and because they were marching to get to the battlefield, which was how they knew war to be fought on a battlefield, they couldn't make sense of the fact that the colonists and the Native Americans were shooting at them from behind the trees. So they're so focused on what Rosenberg calls the canons of their craft, which is we fight battles on an open field, that they missed the reality and they were slaughtered. So she's drawing on that example, which I think is an amazing uh, uh, image. So here's what she says, 1968. Institutions and movements atrophy, theaters wither away or become stale when contact with reality is weakened and when imitation or uh, repetition substitutes for direct experience and constant improvisation. Theaters in America face that danger at this moment. They are like the redcoats in Rosenberg's description. They are marching according to the canons of their craft and do not see what is behind the trees. When I look around, however, beyond our too perfected technique and what Rosenberg calls the canons of our craft, a deep visceral intuition tells me that the power of our art is being blunted, deadened, and caged. We are like the redcoats in the wrong place. Washington, D.C., the nation's capital city, is the first city in the country to become predominantly Negro, 63%. And she's using the term Negro, which was uh, what she would have used in 1968. Its school system is over 90% Negro. Yet we have no Negro actors in our permanent company, and attendance by Negro members of the community, except for plays like The Great White Hope, Blood Knot, and Othello, which have Negro actors on stage, is practically nil. The Kerner Commission on Civil Disorders recent report concluded that our nation is moving towards two societies, one black, one white, separate but unequal. It warned against the development in our major cities of an urban apartheid. This is the single most pressing social phenomenon of our day, and with isolated exceptions, absent from our stages. One would think it did not exist. The Negroes struggle for power, economic power, business power, political, intellectual, psychological, human power, foundationally affects his relationships with other Negroes, with whites, and with himself. This struggle reverberates through contemporary American life, each of us feels its vibrations every day, and yet we come into our theater at night as if into an unreal world. A white audience sits around a stage upon which a white company tells the sad tales of the death of kings. Surely we are in the wrong place. And it is not a geographical dislocation, it is a profound aesthetic dislocation. 
The style of our art is cut off from its source. Just a little bit more. In Tell It Like It Is, Negro columnist Chuck Stone remembers, my minister in Hartford always told the story of a little boy who used to race the old trolley cars pulled by horses. The boy would run along for a while with the trolley car, sprint ahead, and then drop back to taunt the motorman. What say, Mr. Motorman, can't you go any faster? Yes, son, I can, replied the motorman, but I've got to stay with the car. We are all, all the theaters, simply staying with the car. By doing so, we deny to our work a dimension of tension, abrasion, contemporaneity, connection, immediacy, aliveness, a dimension of power. So that's Zelda in 1968. <laughs> and here we are in, what year is this? 2019. And some of you have run things of, in some measure for a long time. Some of you are starting. Some of you are on the precipice. Um, and uh, so the question is really, who do you bring with you? Who do you leave behind? What are you bringing with you? How do you think about the past in, as you imagine and build the future for your theater, for our culture? And I do have a sense that unlike the founding of the theaters, which were really the attempt to build theaters in this country and, and affect culture that way, that your change is a change not just of leadership, but an attempt to really affect cultural change. And you guys have been doing this work for a long time in really different venues. Um, so <laughs> follow Zelda, I throw it to you. Anybody wanna go first? I know Maria doesn't. <laughs> I'll go. Yeah, Stephanie. Um, I thought a lot about what, who to bring into the space today. And normally I would bring in um, something from Thornton Wilder about the socialness of theater. But that somehow didn't feel authentic or appropriate today. Um, I, I am spending a lot of my time these days interrogating lovingly but interrogating um, the foundation on which this art form is built and the constructs of um, exclusion and oppression that we perpetuate every day within it. And I'm struck actually, we, I mean, this is like a little bit of a tangent, but I'm struck by the quote from Zelda that felt, that feels simultaneously like heartbreaking and encouraging and nourishing and it makes me angry because the quote implies a passiveness, a lack of agency, and a lack of complicity that I think is not true. That it, I think it's really important to think about um, not just what is done to our art, but that we have the agency to either um, reinforce it or dismantle it. And therefore, I'm sitting here today with, um, I've, I've started to reach out beyond um, the theater makers I love and adore from our foundational um, years, and I've started to reach into present day activist spaces. Um, so this is where I'll ask Maria to pull her book, Emergent Strategy, out of her backpack. <laughs> <laughs> as we both obviously showed up with, with this on our mind and our heart. And I wanna read to you um, a passage from Emergent Strategy by Adrienne Marie Brown that I, I use as a kind of totem every day. Um, Art is not neutral. It either upholds or disrupts the status quo, advancing or regressing justice. We are living now inside the imagination of people who thought economic disparity and environmental destruction were acceptable costs for their power. So that, I carry that with me like on the regular and that is what I use every time I go into a casting meeting, a hiring session, whether it's about HR or designers or, 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 or. Thank you, yeah, we'll come back, yeah. I feel like I should go next since I have the, <laughs> I feel like the theme. Um, I think, uh, yeah, right, oh no, but I have to read from it. Um, uh, 
so yeah, I, I, I struggled with thinking about um, the past and the ancestors. There's so many people who I would want to bring into the space. Um, no question, one of them is sitting right there, um, Howard Shawitz. I'm so sorry, Howard, I have to, because what you did uh, almost 40 years ago is, is the, I'm, I'm here because of what it is that you created and we were able to create here in DC. And the thing that I, I would quote you that I still carry through is um, Wooly is here to um, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. That is Howard Shawitz. <laughs> um, so I just want to bring you, you're, you're as much on this stage as I am. Um, and I think that one of the things that is uh, happening, at least in the, in the progress jump, is, um, is this feeling of, um, uh, we've done a lot of looking <laughs> behind us. Um, and um, we are, I, I believe I'm saying we, as like a, co a cohort of folks who are taking over these organizations, we're really interested in actually sort of um, creating the new language, the language that we're going to actually all hopefully become comfortable with in our practices um, that is based on what is actually, as Zelda actually talks about, what is happening around us. And that language is created at every single moment in culture, right? Like it is changing all the time. That is changing all the time and we all have to actually take responsibility for getting hip with <laughs> how it's changing for people, right? And so our theater organizations have to do that too. So, um, so I want to bring also Adrienne Marie Brown into the space, but for me this is, um, less of the philosophy and actually more of um, the kind of list of things that I'm looking at when I think about how to make change in the future. Um, and so you don't have to write them all down because you can buy the book. It's uh, Principles of Emergent Strategy. <laughs> um, and you know, put money in her pocket because she's awesome. Um, but, uh, but here's just like a, a short list of the things that I think about and I have printed up on my, you know, above my desk. Small is good, small is all, right? So hyperlocal, right, in some ways. Change is constant, be like water. There is always enough time for the right work. There is a conversation in the room that only these people at this moment can have, find it. Never a failure, always a lesson. Trust the people. If you trust the people, they become trustworthy. Move at the speed of trust. Focus on critical connections more than critical mass. Build the resilience by building the relationships. Less prep, more presence. <laughs> and what you pay attention to grows. Th <laughs> there's this, I, I just, on that last point, I just want to, I, I think about this so often, there was a um, documentary of, uh, what was his name, the animator, Chuck Jones, who did the Roadrunner and all that stuff, and he tells the story about a, um, an art teacher who reprimands a, a, a little girl for drawing a flower that's bigger than herself. He looks at this picture she's drawn of her little self and the big flower and says, no, that's not the way they are. They're small and you're big, because he thinks it's about self-esteem, but the thing you look at grows. It's, so, it's such a perfect. I also want to bring something up. What just happened here with Stephanie and I is um, also a small example of us attempting to make uh, abundance actually the thing that we walk through the world with. So one of the questions that you said, um, Scott, uh, Todd, was uh, uh, what do you want to leave behind? And scarcity, the idea of scarcity, the idea that we don't have enough as the wealthiest country in the world is just, I'd like to leave that behind. And so in even this moment of just seeing each other and being like, oh, we have the same book, 
there is a world, imagine a world where not that long ago we would have been like, ah, I gotta change mine. I actually need to be individual. My individual self is more important actually. And my ego is more important in this moment to actually separate myself from Stephanie in some way. And I just wanna point to the fact that like actually together, you, you're, we're, we're making a point by keeping it that way, right? And that's like a really small example of just uh, shifting to an abundant strategy rather than a scarcity strategy. Does that make sense? I'm gonna let some of these guys go so that uh, uh, <laughs> you, know, you can mix it up a little bit. Gentlemen, I invite you to speak. Dope. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely, I'll jump in. I'll jump in for sure, for sure. <laughs> um, so I, I too struggled with this question because I thought there were so many people that I wanted to bring into this space. Um, my father, who was a militant Black Panther, who demanded my Black education in white space, who demanded that my white teachers give me a Black education. And that Black education, if they didn't know it, they were required to learn it. Mm -hmm. So there was something so profound about this idea of like, who can I bring? I would love to call on my father. I would love to call on Antezaki Shange, who taught me personally like what it was to be an activist and to use your art as activism. Um, I, and, and then I continue to search. And, and I think that the person that I would actually love to call into the space is James Baldwin. Um, when, I, when I imagine my artistry, when I imagine who I am and what I wanna do with my artistry, I center James Baldwin often. Um, James Baldwin <coughs> gave voice to very uh, ideas that, that are difficult to wrap your mind around. Um, he was really interested in intersectionality, what it was to be a black man in America, yes, but what it also was to be a gay man in America. And so when I start imagining my own sense of activism, I, I, I center this idea of intersectionality. What is at the center and how do we find commonality there? And I think that Baldwin did that quite brilliantly. Um, and so in one of his very last interviews, I, I think Baldwin spoke to me most clearly about what my role as an artist activist is. Um, he writes, art has to be a kind of confession. I don't mean a true confession in the sense of that dreary magazine. The effort it seems to me is, if you can examine and face your life, you can discover the terms with which you are connected to other lives, and they can discover too the terms with which they are connected to other people. This has happened to every one of us, I'm sure. You read something which you thought only happened to you and you discover it happened 100 years ago to Dostoevsky. This is a very great liberation for the suffering, struggling person who always thinks that he is alone. This is why art is important. Art would not be important if life were not important. Most of us, no matter what we say, are walking in the dark, whistling in the dark. Nobody knows what is going to happen to him from one moment to the next or how one will bear it. This, irreducible, this is irreducible, and it's true for everybody. Now it is true that the nature of society is to create among its citizens a, so a society to dismantle the illusion of safety, but it's also absolutely true that the safety is always necessarily an illusion. Artists are here to disturb the peace. And so I want to use my artistry to do just that. Disrupt the peace, disrupt easy conversations, particularly around activism. I am very interested in the use of uh, the word activist and what we really mean by activist. And so I think Baldwin asks us to really critically analyze what that is. And I wanna use my art to do that. So that's who I call into the space. Thank you. So. In the spirit of abundance, so do I. <laughs> yeah, and I and I also was thinking like, oh gosh, S Stephanie, if I've already had this conversation, I'm going to bring up Baldwin again. You know, <laughs> while, while she's sitting here. But it is so true. It's for me, um, Baldwin was just an incredibly early influence before I actually knew who Baldwin was. I read The Fire Next Time when I was 13 and read, wrote, wrote an essay about it that won some prizes. But the thing that happened is that I thought, oh, I am synthesizing my thoughts and, and, and if I say it, maybe someone will listen. It was the first lesson that actually I could say a thing and then it wouldn't just be in my journal, in my diary, and that there was power in actually exchange. And so I've been thinking about violence. I've been thinking about congregation. I've been thinking about mortality. Um, this, uh, I've been thinking about 
how we can't see what's before us. And so this, this idea of the redcoats going like the battle's over there, you know, when <laughs> it's so obviously around here. <laughs> I've been thinking about how it is that we are not able to engage in a very effective way with the politics in the world such as it is because we think the battle's over there and we can't see what's before us and in, in, the, in our inability to see, we have an inability to act. So I'm, I'm gonna bring Baldwin back in with a slightly earlier essay um, that's around the creative process and the role of the artist. Um, the artist is distinguished from all other responsible actors in society. That is the politician, the legislator, the educators, the scientists by the fact that he cannot allow any consideration to supersede his responsibility to reveal all that he can possibly discover concerning the mystery of the human being. Society must accept some things as real, but he, the artist, must always know that visible reality hides a deeper one, and that all of our action and our achievement rest on things that are unseen. A society must assume that it is stable, but the artist, must know and must let us know that there is nothing stable under heaven. One cannot possibly build a school, teach a child, drive a car without assuming um, or taking some things for granted, but the artist cannot and must not take anything for granted, but must drive to the heart of every answer and expose the question the answer hides. Societies never know it, but the war of an artist with his society is a lover's war. And he does, at his best, what lovers do, which is to reveal the beloved to himself. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> um. I moved to uh, the Southwest, to Arizona, three years ago after a decade in Chicago. Um, and two questions that have become clearer to me in the relationship between activism and art making that the Southwest has made clearer to me and the complexity of the battles going on in the Southwest. Uh, in some ways, kind of a, a front edge of a lot of battles happening in this country right now. Uh, those two questions are um, particularly for artists who step into spaces that they say are about change. What are you willing to risk? And what is the promise you make when you say you are a listener in our community? And to me, those two questions are questions that as I try to frame for myself my dissatisfaction with the trajectory of the American not-for-profit um, theater complex of the last 50 years, which to me has a very powerful legacy, but also to me has not been an ideal theater in so many ways. Um, although there have been many, many, many ideal visionaries at the center of trying to guide that trajectory, is trying to, th trying to understand the relationship and responsibility of institutions that have public good at the center of their mission and the artists who are charged with leading them sustainably um, in meaningful and uh, economically viable terms. I think that those questions are ones that in my observation are at the heart of a lot of the questions that leaders who are taking over these institutions are grappling with so powerfully to the benefit of all of us sort of in the field. And it's a tremendously vital time, I think, because those questions are being asked. I have that book in my bag, too. I mean, it's, it's a great book. And to me, it, uh, it relates to, I guess, the, the two folks that I bring into the room are two folks that I was privileged to have as mentors and friends, Ping Chong and Augusta Boal, both of whom I got to spend time with, learning from, and collaborating with. Uh, Augusto's no longer with us. Ping certainly is. Um, and both of them, uh, something I value greatly in their practice and in the sort of organizations that they have uh, built at various times in their lives and careers, is a commitment to process. And something that, that you read, 
Maria, you know, it, it will, good work will take the time that it takes, I'm paraphrasing. But I imagine there's a lot of people in here who have interactions with institutions and systems where it's pretty clear to you what would need to happen, or at least you have a thought, an impulse on what would need to happen ethically for certain kinds of practices to take place or relationships to be built or change to occur. And very often the system or institution is set up in a way where that time does not exist. And yet we know that without that time, we actually know what can't happen. We know. It's, it's, it's not that we think maybe it will anyway. We actually know. We just are very, are very practiced for many reasons at having to say, okay, the time doesn't exist. And, and we are in a moment where I think many people are saying, okay, what needs to change for that time and that relationship building to actually be the primary thing? Um, uh, I'll, in service to the conversation, rather than read the quotes, I'll say from Ping, what I bring into the space is a rigor around commitment to aesthetic experimentation and true relationship building in community outside of the art space. And from Augusto, what I, what I always bring is a belief that no matter how horrid the suffering around one is, he, who saw and experienced a lot of pain and trauma, always believed that theater was a way he could collaborate with friends and neighbors and meaning makers to imagine another future. And that that collective imagining was another future was as necessary an effort of any artist as telling beautiful stories. And that the two didn't have to be mutually exclusive and often are inclusive, but for him, that imagining with a purpose uh, was crucial. So that's what I'll offer. all fantastic. Uh, <laughs> I should have gone earlier. Tamala <laughs> uh, gave you a chance. I know, you, you missed it. Um, I was just, I mean, like, I just kind of just kind of just sitting with kind of like all of this, this wisdom and just, just just so much there to uh, to, to think about. And um, and I guess you know just kind of just, just kind of holding that. Um, and then I just think about just kind of like how, like I, I'm always kind of astounded like when I end up on the stage kind of with like these brilliant folks in, in, in the presence of other brilliant folks. And because um, like in so many ways, like I, I've just lived a life outside of, mostly outside of institutions. And, um, and, and so, so I'm really appreciating this big thinking and, uh, and so much, you know, I, I really appreciate it very much. It's like, in, in, you know, bringing your father into this space, and I was just thinking about my father, you know, who's 72, refuses to retire because all he's, because he's worked since he was 11. And he doesn't know a life where he doesn't work, and so he's terrified that if he stops working, he's gonna die. And it's just like, you know, and so, so like there's something about like working that I just like, like for me, like um, I, I'm carrying kind of that, that, that the thing, that, that the work that we do. Um, and, and, and the, you know, as I thought about the question of, of who do we want to bring in, uh, I'm just so aware of those, like the, the, the paths that, that have been kind of carved out for me that, that I get to kind of continue on and hopefully expand a little bit for, for, for others. Um, and so, so, so you know, in, in, that, in that kind of thinking about my father, thinking about this, I think about just kind of the, the art the celebration that was just always present, that lived outside of our institutions. The, the, I think about just kind of the way that people would kind of in the neighborhoods where we grew up that would just decorate their yards. <laughs> and, and the expression of that and the, the singing on the Saturday night, you know, as we were kind of having family meals or the storytelling and the jokes recounted uh, uh, that that happened, and and so so something I hold very dear are just um, the grassroots part, the the part, the the work that happens outside of our theaters, and 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 how how there's so much value, like people have it, people people have art and theater in their lives, and 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 how do we hold that up? 
um, I think about, uh, so, so the people I think about, that to, to, to answer Todd's question, you know, uh, uh, you know there, there's a guy back in Wisconsin named Robert Gard, uh, uh, who was just committed his life to, um, to grassroots theater, to say like, what are the stories around us? Like, who are the people who are telling the local stories in a local place celebrating this land, this culture, this community? And then I think about, you know, uh, uh, Garcia Lorca in, in, in Spain with La Baraca, who's touring to small places saying, we all deserve theater. And I think about Luis Valdez, who kind of did his version of that in, in, uh, uh, in fields, in kind of farming fields across the, the California, the Southwest. And then I think about like, the people who just like offered me so much and, and gave me so many opportunities. Bill Rausch and Allison Carey, who, uh, who founded Cornerstone Theater Company. And, um, and so, so these are all folks who are kind of continuing this line of, of this grassroots theater notion of place, of, of the work that happens kind of inside, in place of a culture, of a people with, for, and by. And, um, and so, so, so that, that, that brings me to kind of a, a, a quote that I actually, so, so in my mind, I think this is a Todd London quote. So I, uh, and, and if it's not, if these are not, you, okay, if these are not your words, I think I heard it from you. Yeah, you did. Okay. <laughs> but, they're, but they're words that actually live with me. Um, if the regional movement of six, if the regional theater movement of 60 years ago was about decentralization, we find ourselves at a moment of recentralization, recentering the American theater in our neighborhoods, town squares and community centers and changing the way theater fits into everyday life. Yeah. Is that you? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yay. I think that was 1989. Uh, Bloomsburg. It was about Bloomsburg. Yeah. 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 Uh, but but that 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 is the like that that that. Thank you. Wow. Okay. Um so I've been taking notes and I've been trying to listen really hard and I, I'm thinking about that quote about the, there's a conversation in the room, you've you got to find it. And I kind of want to get out of the way and let you guys have it. I'm not going to leave the stage as much as I kind of want to. Um, it's, so you'll do that. But I, I, rather than me respond, I wonder if you have things you want to respond to in each, what you said, what you read, questions for each other. I, I, I do want to know what you all want to leave behind. I do want to know what, you, what you're <laughs> done with <laughs> so that we can all talk about that. Um, I'm very interested in leaving behind uh, an oversimplification of activism. I think that if the center of a conversation is like, racism is bad, then, then for me that's an oversimplification. So I'm interested in leaving oversimplified conversations <laughs> behind. Like, let's get it, because when we start moving past that oversimplification, everybody kind of gets messy and dirty in it. Right, and, and so there is something about our shared humanity, so I'm gonna leave oversimplification behind. I would really love to leave behind the word diversity. Ooh. Hey, Grace, talk about it. <laughs> but that's not, but, but also. But, um, the, the thing that I'm sitting here, I'm struck by as we talk about the intersection of art and activism and the sort of, um, the promise of the artists or the arts inside of a community, we tend to it's not, it's not wrong, but we tend to lean into the sort of um, the soft skills or the, the intangibles, the soul nourishment and the representation and the, the uh, um, and there is so much more. <laughs> um, and I want to leave behind the, uh, the simple, the oversimplification, I think, of the idea that um, our art and activism takes place on the stage and is represented by X number of black or brown bodies or X number or, or the content of the socio-political whatever, whatever. 
because it also takes place in the hiring, the wages, the production budgets. It, it takes place in the earning potential of a, for this theater versus that theater when we're talking about playwrights. That is where the activism begins. Um, and I, I really want to be done with the idea that it that, that once it shows up on stage in our stories, that we've checked a box. I want to leave behind the idea that if you make it, they will come. Uh, this is not true. <laughs> if you make it, you have made it. <laughs> and also the idea of the theater as a building. Um, that the theater is people and that the magic of the theater is in the congregation and is the community that you can call forth and that the richness of the theater is in the people who are in the room and that the more profound and different those stories of people are, the richer the experience for everybody, the audience and the artists. And that that's the thing that we have to be concentrating on is making sure that we gather people from many different stories um, and many different points of view so that we can be reflections. Uh, I want to, uh, I guess, two things in this moment. One is related to what you offered, Stephanie. Uh, I want to leave behind the notion that a theater's output or product, meaning generally what is being offered here as an example of the virtuosity that that particular theater can accomplish, whatever the venue or event. I want to leave behind the notion that that is the only significant contribution that the artists involved in that space and building have to make to the public good of the place where that building exists, or not a building. And, and part of that is the, the notion that the assets that artists, all disciplines, but we're in a theater space today, the assets that artists bring in a process kind of focused way have tremendous opportunity to impact community outcomes in addition to the way that you frame that. Mark and I are actually a part of a conversation on this stage Saturday that's very much about that. But the second thing I'd like to leave behind is I'd like to leave behind boards that out of um, nervousness or <laughs> I'm sorry, my mic's gonna go out, but I, I'd like to leave behind boards that, not boards in general, but boards that through um, uh, continuing to push the narrative of uh, what gets presented has a direct relationship to uh, viability, both economic and stature, begin to take on a certain um, gatekeeper role, not just in terms of content, but in terms of uh, accompliceness, accomplishing and allying around a community, around the kind of processes that a theater and artist might get involved in. That boards should be shepherds of the vision of public good and artistic excellence, but not, not, not what a place should be doing in relation to what might make it hard for that organization to continue in a way that board thinks is viable. I want to add to that because I'd like to leave behind the idea that people of color don't have spending power. So, please. <laughs> because I think that that dovetails exactly with what you're saying, which is basically that like it won't quote unquote sell, right? Or, um, and uh, leads or it'll us. Heckle, it'll get people upset when they stop coming. Yeah, it'll get people, just to repeat that for the live stream, uh, it'll get people upset, you know, and people will heck heckle or something like that. I, yeah, I, um, uh, right, so the, the country is moving towards, mo um, you know, a majority uh, people of color very, very soon. It's happening. They have spending power. If they're not seeing themselves represented on stage or stories or being reached out to in the kind of building relationships that we're talking about because we're using corporate strategies in the nonprofit art to be able to actually reach communities, which makes no sense <laughs> because we're not Nike. <laughs> um, right? We're not, we're, um, so by doing that, ultimately, um, we're really cutting ourselves off at the knees in terms of those relationships that we can have um, and going into them with not actually, um, without the kind of like, I don't know, generosity of spirit that is needed to be able to actually allow um, artists of color and people of color to feel uh, welcome in those spaces. 
I, I also want to, to, to let's just leave behind our spaces. Like I think uh, architecture is uh, is is really problematic, and I think it's it's really impacting aesthetics. And I think a lot of the things that you know, like uh, I was talking to Nick Sly yesterday, and he was talking about like with the wilding of cultures, and and uh, and and there's something about like that just got me thinking about like how do we that idea of, of you know like it's gotten too studied, it's gotten too too clean, too nice, too too everything. And I think a part of it is just it's just ar it's the problem of architecture. Uh, so so there's that. And then and then like frankly, man, I just kind of want to fucking blow up capitalism. Like I just want to like enough. Like just leave it behind. Like, like no more. Like it's the it's the root of so many problems. Like I just like that's just kind of what I'm kind of working on. Like like how do we just chip? Just, just enough. Can can I ask a question? Please. Uh, a, a question of, of, of you all. I mean, between Baldwin and the book, Emergent Strategy, there, there is an incredible strain in this conversation around organizing and around analysis. Uh, and so I'm really curious how folks up here are bringing organizing and critical analysis to their decisions as artistic leaders, as uh, leaders of staffs, working overseeing HR, and how you think about and negotiate your relationships with community. And I would partly even, I mean, I believe you just worked on a pretty big show in New York, am I right about that? Yes, Th like a, a pretty big Tony nominated show. Oh, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> so, I mean, you're in, in that world, which isn't even the not-for-profit complex, but is a whole nother complex. So I'm just interested in how these values and threads play out in the different spaces that you're all negotiating and leading. That show being Hades Town, that Tamala was the associate director of. Yes. I um, I don't have this other book with me, but um, Eric Liu, who runs Citizen University in <laughs> yes in Seattle, um, wrote this book called um, "You're More Powerful Than You Think," and I read it. I can't remember when. Uh, it was all about. Um, activating individual power, um, activating collective power, and understanding the levers of, of power that are inside of all of us. And um, that really landed on me. And so now as I go into um, rehearsal rooms or staff meetings and what have you, I may get fired for saying this, but um, but I find myself saying to my team, if they're unhappy with a thing, to organize themselves to come, to, ri to rise up against the executive leadership or whatever, um, because, because I hear so much, oh, I, I was waiting to be empowered to do that. No. You have the power. You have the power to push different levers in front of you. Which lever are you gonna push? Find it, push it over and over again, and then find a friend and push it together. Push it together, and you just amplify your voice. Um, so that concept and that idea is, is, is th something I'm navigating every day, and what is the right balance of like telling folks, you wanna know what you all make, your salaries? Share it. Don't wait for me to give you permission to just share it. Just talk amongst yourselves, rise up, and demand to pay equality. Um, I'm navigating that impulse with like <laughs> capitalism or what or whatever yeah. that you know. Um, I, uh, I so appreciated you bringing up the oversimplification um, because in case you couldn't tell, I am pretty white looking. <laughs> and one of the things that as a white passing Latina, I have to deal with is being sort of lumped into the category, right, of um, person of color without actually speaking to my particular skin experience, which is super different from um, my darker brothers and sisters, right? So I get to maneuver through the world in, in, um, uh, without uh, certain biases and prejudices that, for example, my sister can't move through the world like that. So the thing that I'm bringing up to the table is about this analysis is like, I am doing that analysis, I, I have to keep doing it, I'm gonna be doing it for the rest of my life, <laughs> right? And so what I'd like to offer 
um, to folks in the room, in addition to emergent strategy, any white person in the room, if you wanna um, deepen your analysis, there's a book that just came out called White Fragility that is a great book to do that. And I would suggest that if you haven't read it, please do read it. Um, and even just for myself, like I, you know, it's so funny whenever I talk to um, communities of color, they're like, oh yeah, I'm gonna read White Fragility, I wanna go read it read that book, and I'm like, well, you don't really need, I mean, you deal with this stuff all the time, right? Um, but it actually, <laughs> but it actually does bring up a lot of um, different, it makes, makes um, uh, it made me feel like, oh, I wasn't crazy, you know, that things are happening, right? You sort of feel a little crazy that when, when things occur in that way. The other thing that I wanna say is part of my positional power, but also my whiteness has to do, like ha makes me specifically in a room with people of color shut up more, right? It, and make sure that I'm centering the experience of, again, folks that don't necessarily have the floor and that kind of power, right? My darker brothers and sisters. And in rooms of white folk, I better speak the hell up, <laughs> right? From my experience, because that's my responsibility. That's my skin experience, my skin privilege. Yeah? You help, uh, uh, you help me actually figure that out. So I really appreciate you, Annabelle. Um, so I just recently became artistic director at Theater Alliance, and Theater Alliance is in Anacostia, which is a historically black neighborhood. Now, I am African-American, but African-Americans are not a monolith. And I, even as I come in, am an outsider in this community. So I've been spending a lot of time actually getting to know my community. It's important for me as a leader, and when we start talking about activism, I am a firm believer that activism is local. Activism isn't something that we do on the national level. We do it on the local level. So I'm very interested in what's happening in my community, and I, as a new leader, cannot go into that community and assume what that community needs. Who am I to assume what that community needs? So the first thing that I did is I moved to Anacostia. My partner and I got a house, and, and I am getting to know the neighborhood. And so I've been telling everyone I am on my Evita tour. I am like shaking hands, <laughs> waving, rocking babies. Um, <laughs> I am getting to know my neighborhood because ultimately I want to serve my neighborhood. Uh, and so for me to do that, I need to know folks who, who live there. Um, and I need to fold myself into that community so that then when I know what that community needs, I know how to program that on my stages. The goal of our work at Theater Alliance is to create conversations in our community. And I think Colin Hovde, the previous artistic director, did something quite brilliant in creating space post our shows. Um, after our, our performances, we always have these post-show conversations. And it's interesting to watch as our community sits in a circle and talks about not how the sauce is made. We're not interested in like, I really like the show. How do you memorize lines? That's not of interest, right? But instead, how are you emotionally involved in this work? And I think that the next phase for our company is really to teach our audiences now in this circle, if you are so moved by what you saw and what you experienced, this is how you move to action in this community. This is how you work in this community. Because at the end of the day, for me, activism, again, is local. And so if I'm inspiring my audiences to get involved in what's happening in Anacostia, what's happening across the river, then perhaps we can start to bridge that difference of what's happening across the river. I have a, I have a question. So one of the things that I am um, struggling with or that it occupies a lot of my mind and conversation, this is apropos of like, how do you come in from the outside and um, ins I mean, insinuate yourself it sounds like bad, but um, <laughs> you know, become a citizen of your new community. Um, and one of the things I find myself, the impulse that I have as a leader, as an artistic producer and as a citizen um, is to constantly be asking groups of people, how can Baltimore Center Stage be of service to you? How can I be of service to you? And I ask that question very authentically because I legitimately don't think I have the answer. You know, I have impulses, but I'm curious, particularly in the work that you do, Michael, how, how you even go about assessing 
how to be of service? Or does the idea of service even live, I, it seems like it's at the center of so much of, of what um, you all are doing, and I would love to hear more about how that manifests itself. I can say for me, we've actually, we try not so much to use the term service, um, not just language-wise, but idea-wise, and, and um, the way that you just said, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out like how my theater can be of service. What I think I've found and what I try to work on is how do we build a relationship and, and listen, and before asking what I can do, try to get to a place where I can uh, learn about what someone else not just needs, but is aspiring to and imagining. And that's crucial, like, like an asset-based model rather than a deficit-based model. Like, what's happening here? What are the strengths here? Because there's many, wherever we are, right? Uh, even mapping local assets. And then sort of trying to understand what are the stories this place tells itself about itself? And what are the stories this place perceives others tell about it? And what's the distance between those two things? And how does that live in the people who live in this place if we're privileged enough to be in a conversation where folks want to share that with us? But, but I think it is about like what's, what's the aspiration so that there's the possibility for collaboration, uh, support, alliance, and accomplishing, perhaps, rather than um, I can serve you with the resources I have, which kind of assumes you, there certainly must be something you need from me. Now often what it results in is like, we may have resources, artistically or in some, in some of many ways, that actually can be in service too. But, I, but I, my experience is starting with the frame of how to be in service to is already kind of perpetuating, you know, both systems of, of whiteness and saviorness and all that stuff. And also, you know, some of the that we've like, been doing kind of in Minneapolis uh, 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 is, is just thinking about being a good neighbor and just like creating this good neighbor framework of, of, you know, we all know what that means and we all know that it just kind of relies on trust and, you know, other people understand that concept. And so, uh, so just like, how can we just be a good neighbor to, to the people who, to everybody who's around us uh, uh, is another way of, that, that we've been approaching it. I've been examining in my own community what have been the barriers to entrance. What are the ways in which the cultural institution of theater has disenfranchised people of color at large, yes, but also people in my community? And, and asking them point blankly, why is it that you've not gone to Theater Alliance? What has stopped you from coming? And, and also being able to like sit very quietly and have my feelings hurt at times, like to hear the ways in which my community has responded or is responding to the work um, has, has been really interesting for me. And I think that at the center now of what I'm looking to do is asking myself, how can we share and pool resources? I know that when I start thinking about the, com the community leaders within Anacostia, we all have a vested interest in building Anacostia and creating a space that is a community, that is black, that is positive. And so how are we pooling and sharing resources? Uh, and how are we pooling and sharing audience? What drew you there in the first place to Anacostia? Uh, I, I will say that it was one of the post-show conversations. I went to go see a show and I had one of the most powerful experiences. I will say that the thing that drew me to Theater Alliance was uh, a post-show conversation in which I sat in a circle with perhaps some of the, like it looked like the United Colors of Benetton. And, and there were all ages and, and everyone was sharing these very personal experiences that were related to the art and it started this idea of like, wow, this is community, and what a powerful, powerful experience. And so how do we build upon that? And how do we invite more people into that circle? I'm always imagining that circle is so large that we don't have space in the theater, right? But how are we making yeah. space for everyone? Could I ask you a question, Tamla? Well, a lot of your current work is about dialogue and bringing folks together, I think, particularly around uh, different experiences and trying to make spaces. I know the piece you worked on in Cleveland and the piece you're gonna share a bit of here. So I wonder this whole conversation about organizing and 
I'm, I'm going to say work that attempts to kind of bring people across borders or boundaries. Like, how are you thinking about that work? Uh, yeah, I, I think I'm definitely like a theater worker. Like, I, I find myself empowered inside of the, uh, or at least if I can put it in the scope of my brain, that what I'm doing is creating it through the lens of theater, right? And that's my activism. And it's a, you know, and I think, I, rec I was like, Mark is such a, pure artist, you know? <laughs> and that, that, that idea that the work itself at hand is, is, is valuable, and creating, um, right, t if, you, if you come on Friday, Friday tomorrow, uh, at five o'clock, I'm working with, at six o'clock, uh, <laughs> six o'clock, at five o'clock I'll be rehearsing, um, working uh, with um, On Guard Arts with um, um, uh, Layla Buck, who is creating a, pl a play called Mix and Match that is about two different kinds of communities coming together, a Muslim uh, family and a Christian family, and we're all gonna go to a wedding party together, the whole audience, you know? And everybody understands what it means to have two different kinds of families try to come together um, with their own particular traditions, and really that's a sort of, you know, microscopic way of looking at the macro, which is this country is a bunch of different frickin' families trying to come together, you know, in celebration and in mourning. And um, so I, I think that if I can get people in a room together, sitting next to each other, breathing the same air and listening to the same good stories, not the bad stories, but the good stories, that if we can start there, that's an already radical act of congregation. And we can make nothing by ourselves. We can make everything with each other. And I mean, we can make arguments, and we can make fights, and we can make violence, and we can make wars, but let's come out of those things on the other end knowing something different about who we are. I'm okay with conflict. That comes with community but we also have to be able to, all of us, be all right with not agreeing um, and also respecting the fact that we can live together in disagreement like most families do. I'm happy to ask. I'm, I'm enjoying you asking each other. Um, I keep, I'm, I'm now my mind is turning around this notion of what you want to leave behind because it has another meaning, right? Which is like, w what do you want to leave behind when you're done with whatever it is you're doing right now? And that's a really lousy question to ask, but I want to ask it because I'm curious how you think future, uh, the present is so present in all the things you're saying and the past, we've been talking about a little bit, but what is the future that you want to leave behind? I, I hear that it's not the same future as maybe the founders of this piece of the field, you know, leaving behind buildings and institutions and staffs, and um, so what might that leaving be? been thinking about mortality an awful lot and I and I this is not your question but it occurred to me in, in listening also to the opening um, welcome yesterday that actually the thing about it is I don't I'm not I don't want to think about what I'm leaving behind because I think about what I'm leaving behind I think about leaving and what I'm concerned with right now is living and staying and how do I, and we just had this conversation, Heather and I, how do I, death is gonna come, like it's inevitable, but how you live, that's the choice I have every day. And the kind of thing I wanna put in the world, um, the dialogues or um, the work or the arguments, that's the thing I'm most concerned with and I don't know what the residual will be and if I worry about that, I will be too afraid. Other people have different ideas. <laughs> when I imagine what theater is in its most beautiful sense in my mind, it's and, and what it really is is it's this it's this public temple that we all go to, and it's the last public temple that we all sit in that we grapple with these ideas, these complex, these difficult ideas. And so I wonder if what I hope 
to leave behind is very <laughs> morbid. Um, but a, a space in which audience can come in and learn very deeply about themselves and also have space to make mistakes. Um, you know, I, I, I think when we start talking about identity politics, it starts getting very tight and tense because there are all of these unspoken rules. And so I, uh, I will say that I was born and raised in Germany and so rules come very easily to me. I love a rule. Um, but when we start talking about like what it is to be and to live in the United States, there are these unspoken rules as a byproduct of all of the things that we've not had conversations around. Who's allowed to say do what? And so how can we create a space in which someone can come in and ask a question and someone who's interested in teaching that can share that idea, a space that we are free to make these mistakes in so that as we leave this public temple, we leave better, stronger, knowing how to move in a larger society and we'll make mistakes out there so that then when we come back in, there's space for more and greater and more complex conversations. Uh, so my um, husband is an amateur mineralogist, or uh, <laughs> so instead of um, works of art in our place, um, we have a bunch of rocks, um, <laughs> lots of really beautiful rocks that he takes lots of pictures of and dusts with a little paintbrush, um, and he <laughs> he loves it. And one of the things that he says, he has said to me, you know, in term, because these rocks, you know, the mines and stuff, they've, you know, they've passed uh, hands, like, you know, for many, 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 many years, right? So he thinks of himself as the temporary keeper of these rocks right now, because they're going to outlive, frankly, all of us. Um, and I, and so I think about that a lot, actually, because, um, particularly with the conversations about climate change and doing something for our world, actually being environmentally conscious, you know, we've got to be intentional about what it is that we're actually trying to save. Because the fact is, in scientific terms, this shit's going to be around. And it's, gonna, and it's been around for a lot longer. I mean, watch Cosmos. <laughs> it's like, it's been for a lot longer than the human race has been. The human race has been, you know, tiny, tiny amount of time compared to um, the eons that uh, stars and planets and galaxies have existed. So I think that's really interesting, right? Because uh, for me, it just gives me a like, <laughs> oh man. So I gotta be really intentional about what it is that we're attempting to save and what it is that we're trying to actually make um, together. And it's why that quote about sort of finding the conversation in the room because it's never gonna happen again with this particular group of people at this particular time, at this particular space, um, feels really very urgent to me in that regard. Because when you think about the millennia stuff, it's like, we're only, <laughs> it's not just that I'm here for only my lifetime, you know, who knows what's gonna happen um, over time. We can do whatever it is that we can, so it stays, um, uh, you know, our children, and there's some legacy in that regard. Um, so I think about that a lot. The other thing that I want to um, bring into the room is Young Jean Lee's We're Gonna Die. Flying V Theater Company in DC is gonna do this soon. They just announced it. And it's a great, great, uh, do you all know it? Know the show? Um, well, so you're gonna, you're gonna sing for a second after me because it's, it's just why not we're in a theater, right? So this is how it goes. Uh, we're gonna die. We're gonna die someday and then we'll be gone. And it'll be okay. We're gonna die. All right, we're gonna do it. So, on the count of three. One, two, three. We're gonna die. We're gonna die someday. Then we'll be gone. And it'll be okay. <laughs> I, I really didn't even take mortality in that question. <laughs> like, that's a, I, I wasn't asking on that, <laughs> but it, it tells us about Tamala, I guess. <laughs> Or yeah, it might it might only be my new uh, the new paradigm I live in where I can only see this far in front of my face. Um, 
I was thinking about, I joke a lot about, um, I'm, I might get fired for this. I, I do, it's a defense mechanism because there's a fear operating in me. I never take for granted the place I'm standing in um, or how long the goodwill of, my, you know, of the people around me will last and how much they'll put up with my shenanigans. Um, <laughs> So I make all of these jokes as I'm like, well, <laughs> might not be here in three years. Um, and and <laughs> that's my alter <laughs> ego, yeah. Um, and so, so whatever time I have here, like each day, I'm trying desperately to, you know, to, to put as many footsteps into the path as possible. Um, to follow, make deeper some footsteps and make new pathways and, you know, offer up my shoulder if somebody needs a boost or step on it. Um, <laughs> but I, ho I hope in all of that, I don't know how to say the tangible thing that I want to leave behind, but there is a like, there it's, it, it lives in the world of an invitation, an invitation or an affirmation to constantly ask why and what if, and um, to never accept the assumption put before you. Um, that is, I hope that becomes the, the kind of total norm in not just the art making, because I feel like it's totally acceptable in the art making, I'm talking about in the entire practice of what we do and who we are and how we interact with each other and our communities. Um, why and what if feel like really important vocabulary words for the future. I, I was I was just gonna say it's funny about whether you think about it in terms of more mortality or not, because I'm sure it's a bit of a Rorschach test, mm -hmm. maybe, because I'm thinking like I'm a, uh, I'm a neurotic 51-year-old Jew with father issues, so if you get me within 10 feet of the word leave or behind, I go to death <laughs> immediately. <laughs> so I'm, that's where I went. Um, and I also, this question also feels like a really important question. I have little kids. So to me, since having kids, the relationship I have as a daily practice to defining purpose has shifted a bit in that if I'm not going to be with them, whether it's just, you know, during the day or at night or like I'm here today, I'm, I'm not there. Like I better be able to answer like how I'm going to talk to them about why I'm not there, both at this age and as they get older. I mean, just constantly. So, I mean, t to me, I, I think very concretely about I want to be a part of a movement that helps artists across disciplines uh, have a clearer sense of the contributions they can make through the output they create, but also through all kinds of process and practice uh, as positive contributors to public good in their community and fighting for justice. I, I wanna be a part of helping systems that are not art systems be prepared to collaborate with artists and culture makers so those contributions can happen effectively, ethically, and productively. And I want to um, be a part of our in incredibly uh, dangerous, awful, fucked up democracy, having the benefit of all the contributors who have creative practice uh, participating in bringing more imagination and collaboration and ethics to how we engage civically with each other and make decisions for ourselves as communities. And those are three things that I think about as sort of compass points. Mark, something to add? Uh, I, I don't, yeah. I, I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know, I, I, I don't, I, you know, like, I think you, you just talked about, you know, when, when, when Tamara was talking about just like, you're focused on just being here, and 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 so I'm just wondering, like, like, I don't know, can can we can in this life with this life do something good, mm -hmm. be good, mm -hmm. do good, and uh, and hope that it leaves something good behind. There's a like a half life that leaves something be behind. Yeah. <sighs> okay. 
Okay. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, I, uh, and uh, thank you, Derek and all, for this, this time together. I, I can't wait to see what you guys do with this moment of refounding and um, dismantling and making anew. And I also really just want to say I, I've sat in so many conference rooms that are full of bullshit and self-promotion that from the moment of the two emergent strategy books on, I'm just so grateful to you guys for your honesty and your passion. So thank you. And thanks to y'all. Thank you. Such a, just to echo, such a um, we're transition into a coda that I think actually will kind of continue the themes of this extraordinary conversation. But it is so, some of you were here yesterday, some of you weren't, but the continuity and energy of uh, what was said about abundance, about connection across in a non-hierarchical way, um, there's so much con there's so much momentum in the conversation <laughs> that's moving forward and that's uh, that was it's, and it's just such an honor to have the seven of you sitting on this stage and I love Mark Bell does his laugh <laughs> um, um, so um, thank you guys hang out in we're gonna shift the space for Nick and Jason but we want I want you to and then we're gonna go to lunch in 15 minutes so this is sort of like the this is the dramaturgy of our event. We're sort of moving from this conversation to a two-person conversation, um, which, I'll which I'll introduce. I did want to say, uh, this is, I guess, part of the transition in the scurrying to get people in the room and introduce, um, you know, a, a, a deeper thing to say about Todd that this work and panel reflects than just, oh, it was inspiring to be at TCG. Um, uh, decades ago, is that I think Todd is, just as James Thompson was talking yesterday about um, uh, care as an art form, I think what Todd's work is gigantic in terms of is appreciation as an art form. And the, that word, like I read Todd's essays and I'm like, oh, that's why I love that work, exactly, but I didn't know it. Um, and so the notion of appreciation as a rigor, as a like rigorous thing with value that like this is not just casual, oh I appreciate you, like that's great. This, that like that work of non-hierarchically noticing and appreciating, you are a signal force in and that is what this gathering is about and that's what this group of people are doing. So that's part of why this is so. So this is the part where I throw all these beautiful leaders off the stage. <laughs> um, and I, um, on the theme of ancestry, we welcome to this. It's one of the privileges I've had just in, you know, curating ahead with folks to this event is having these amazing conversations, usually too short, and imagining pe putting people together like we did with Hopeful Encounters yesterday in these two-person conversations. So this is um, two folks who are doing amazing work and thinking about ancestry in related but different ways than I think we saw here. Um, and I want to welcome to the stage, most of you saw Jason Tamiru yesterday as part of our opening um, land acknowledgement from Malthouse Theater in Melbourne, our Yorta Yorta man, with Nick Sly, um, co-artistic director of Mondo Bizarro in New Orleans. And one of, every time I talk to Nick, my mind just gets bigger and wider, a great, uh, performer, cultural organizer. So um, we're going to welcome Nick and Jason to the stage for a conversation. Good afternoon, everybody. How y'all doing? So we got a quick one and we'll jump into it. Um, so honored to be on the stage with you who I met an hour and a half ago. 
That's pretty great. Uh, and before we begin, I'd just like to bring, uh, I love this question of who you're bringing with you, and I uh, acknowledge and bring into the room a great teacher of mine and of ours, Mr. John O'Neill, who recently passed. Um, just a beautiful, beautiful lover. Um, so we're just going to have a brief conversation, and I'm going to lead it with just an image or an idea. I was talking to Derek in December at the NPN meeting about um, sort of where I was personally and what was coming up for me artistically, and I want to share an idea that we're working on right now um, that is related to the place that we live. And in our home in Louisiana, as many of you know, it's a long and complicated conversation, but the land's disappearing really fast for a variety of reasons. And this year, they cut the levees open south of New Orleans, which was an experiment in rewilding the former paths of the Mississippi. And uh, in 2019, they're going to they're gonna do the big ones. They're called river diversions. And they're going to spend $4.5 billion to reanimate the ancestral paths of the river with the hopes that this could save our home. And um, as I had in the last two years been going through a really deep uh, wrestling with my own personal grief, um, I started to look again at these maps by this man named Harold Fisk. He, uh, he, drew, he walked from Missouri to Donaldsonville, Louisiana, and he drew these ancestral paths of the Mississippi River for the Army Corps of Engineers. They're like a circulatory system of where the river flowed for 12,000 years um, before we levied it. And I began to meditate on um, how have the structures and the systems of control that it takes to strangle a river showed up in the bodies of the people. Um, and in, in particular, how have those systems showed up in my own internal territories of experience? Um, some of those systems I would name are like white supremacy, um, wholesale environmental destruction, winner take all capitalism. Like, how are those things playing out and how we're now trying to address the saving of our landscape? And how are we ready to rewild the land if we have not sufficiently rewilded ourselves? And so this project that we're embarking on is um, these long public walks, 30-mile public walks along the ancestral paths of the Mississippi with anywhere from one to 1,000 people, whoever wants to come. It's a manner of research um, that will then become the sort of information for a public call to the public, to artists, to policymakers, to chefs, to musicians, where we're going to host a floating, a series of floating festivals in New Orleans. So sort of uh, taking a look at how do we uh, show adaptation in the way that we're talking about water, and how do we look towards what it is that we're going to need to do in the home that we live in if we want to have a chance to survive. But really, it's about, this is my image, it's like trying to prod a little bit uh, a relationship between the timely and the timeless is what I've been thinking about. Like, how do we address this time? Mr. Schwenka said it, we're in a recession right now. Like, how do we address the timely in relation to the timeless? And when I think about the timeless, I think about my own ancestors, but back from that, like the ancestral paths of the river, which were there long before my ancestors. And uh, I shared this story with Jason in the lobby up there. And he's like, I know what I'm going to do. I know where I'm going to go. Um, because Derek was talking to me about your work with um, repatriation. And anyone who was here yesterday got to experience the beauty of what Jason shared on stage. And I was so struck by, you follow that path back, and it leads to peace. And um, so yeah, I want to invite you to, to just to bring that re repatriation into the space. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me, and uh, thanks for listening to me too. It, it means a lot, so uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I've come a long, long way, I guess, to be with you, and I guess I've come to bring um, a, fant a story, a story that... Uh, a story of the world, really, and I guess history. History has brought all of us here today. Um, the good, uh, the bad, and the ugly. But history has definitely brought us here today. And I would like to acknowledge all your history. Uh, my people, um, our story. Um, yeah, uh, we go back a long time, a real long time. And we acknowledge that, and we celebrate it. Um, that scares some people, and I don't know why. 
because um, it's our culture and we love our culture and we love our land and other people should too. Um, my story, our story, goes right back to the dream time. And understand the dream time, I guess it's similar to people's heaven. Our dream time is where all our people are. Um, they're spirit ancestors. They created our earth. All the plants, our medicine, animals, our food, our water, our vegetables. Created everything. Our music, our dance, our language. It's been going forever. Yeah, our dream time. We live in a dream here. This is our land. We're born from the earth. We're created from the earth. We connect to the earth. My country, I call it Australia, is made up of 500 nations of Aboriginal people. Within those nations, there are clans and tribes. Those clans and tribes they um, connect to the land. Um, <coughs> what's happened in history? Uh, it's been a little bit unkind for us. Quite cruel. And what we're, I'm trying to do and others, we try to make things right. And I guess the story of repatriation. Uh, it's something that I've done. It's something that I still do. It's something I'm doing directly after this conversation. Yeah. Um, the white men come to our country. They slaughtered us. They almost wiped us off the planet. There's only about 10% of us left. They herded us from our lands and they put us into reserves and institutions. And they told us that what we practiced was the devil. Yeah. We weren't allowed to speak our language. We weren't allowed to do our dance. We weren't allowed to connect with our country. Um... Even our children, they were taken off us. We were dispossessed, dispersed. And those kids were taken to other places. And today, we're still trying to find them. Still trying to bring them back home. Hmm. So, I want to also mention that... Uh, I'm not a leader of my people. I'm a servant. I'm a servant for my people. I do whatever I can to help them out. Um, repatriation. It's really heavy business. Uh, collectors come to Australia. And I guess most sacred place for anyone is where you bury your loved ones, right? It's really special. It's really sacred. It's a place where you go to connect with your family. Yeah. Anyway, these collectors, they found out where our places were, where we buried our people. And not only, not only that, they find out where we buried our people, where they befriended some of our people to find out where our people were buried. And then what happened? Under the cover of darkness, they just go in and take us. Take the bodies of our elders. 
and disperse them all around the country into institutions because there were some theories around that believed we were going to die out. And I was fascinated by our culture because of how long we've been on the planet. So they measured our heads, our fingers, our feet, our legs, all these things dismembered us and they spread them all around, not only Australia, but all around the world. Now in our dream time, in our dreaming, or when we die, we've got to go back to our country. When we go back to our country, we connect with our ancestors, and then from there, we go through to the dreaming. Everything's connected. Our old people, there's no full stop in our, when we die, just continues on. And we reincarnate into trees, the fish, into the children. You know? That's our cycle. That's our system. But how do those people who are taken away, how do they come back to land? Now, 60,000 years of history, we've got medicine men, people with special powers that are buried in the earth. And not only them and others, but they're in these institutions. And our people are crying. Brings a lot of sadness. Our land is crying. Our rivers, everything is crying. Mm. So what I do, I found out where our people are. And I go knocking on their door, sometimes aggressively. And I ask them, can we have our people back? Sometimes there's hesitation because who owns these people? Who owns humanity? You know? Who's got the right to define what that is? But policy and legislation has made these institutions to get our people back. Yeah. So, what do I do when others? We go get our people and we take them back home. We take them back to their country. We bring peace to the land, to all our tribes, to our elders, to everyone. It's really important business. And, you know, I'm sitting here now, nothing scripted, and I'm taken now to, I'm sitting here, and I think about the First Nations mob that are here, and what they've, what they've done, what they're still doing. And that's connection and storytelling. And today, we're mimicking exactly what those people are doing. I'd just like to acknowledge that. So, my work, I work at a major performing arts company as a producer. And I'm not sure if it's an indictment of Australia, or opportunity 
that happened, which I must admit I kicked open the door. <laughs> um, I'm the only producer in Australia that's Indigenous that works in a major performing arts company. So uh, now that it is a major performing arts company, on the main stage, there's now a track into this institution, into this performance space. So when our mob steps in to this environment, it's not cold. Mm. It's not disconnected. It's a place of warmth, inclusiveness, a place where you can come and tell your story and be proud of it. And it's taken me a while to uh, get the confidence, but I have confidence there. And in fact, I've got love for them too. So now it's time to tell the story. The world needs to hear this. And in my capacity as a producer, inspired by my own journey and the journey of my ancestors and everybody else that's been involved with this type of repatriation business, I'm bringing it to the stage. Yeah. And this story is going to be very dark and very haunting and it will be an experience like no other. But I have great confidence in the team that I'm working with, great confidence in um, the workplace that I'm, I'm, I'm in, and most importantly, I've got great confidence in how I'm driven because uh, I always sit, as I mentioned yesterday, and wait for the invitation. And um, I'm getting driven by the old people. They're telling me what to do. And being involved with this repatriation, you connect with the old people. You know, I, I touch them with my own hands and I put them in the earth. And what's written in their files, which can be minimal, you really take and transport it back to this time. And in that time, you can see and feel what was going on, you know? You really, really feel it. And uh, it's dark, it's scary, it's happy, and it's beautiful. And, you know, we've been, a lot of stuff has been taken away uh, from my people. And I always say, um, one thing they can't take is my emotion. Mm -hmm. And my emotion, I, ca I let it, I carry it all the time. And to some people, um, it can be make you really fragile, make you sick, um, but that's okay for me because I need to know that I need to have that feeling because it creates a, an energy that's pure and, and I enjoy that. Jason. Derek told us that the story is never going to be over. And you told me in the lobby that we should stop each other because we're both storytellers. <laughs> I think I'm the de facto timekeeper. Um, 
and everyone's gonna go to lunch. But I wanted to invite you to close and say whatever you wanted to say and also to let everybody know that right after this, Jason's gonna get in a car and go to the Smithsonian and actually today in Washington DC do the real and necessary and emotional work of repatriation. So that's incredible to me and I just wanna offer you. Uh, Thank you. Wish, wish. But and, and if, if you want the last one before we go eat, just. Yeah, I, I do. Uh, I thank you. Uh, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, I think what I want to leave you all, uh, I want to leave you all, I want to challenge you all. It's time. It's time. I was shocked yesterday hearing about this university here have a minimal or not many First Nations people here. That's not right. Everyone deserves an opportunity, an education, a house, clothes, you know, a future. Everyone deserves it. And a lot of us are in, in a place of privilege. And some people can bake in that area, in that place, and just go by with their lives. And that's okay. But some of us who are in these places of privilege have got an opportunity for real change. And I look out here, and of course you must be leaders or servants of your people. So... I challenge you all to connect with the people of this land and the people of where you've come from and help the indigenous people of the world. Help us to get up on even par with everyone else so we can enjoy the world just like everyone else. And I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, friends. Uh, moving just to um, uh, logistics, uh, um, which seems uh, so so small. <laughs> um, so uh, the um, couple things we will resume in this room with um, Martina Mayock, the uh, extraordinary Pulitzer Prize-winning playwright, who's joining us with um, uh, scene work from Sanctuary City and in dialogue with uh, Professor Maya Roth at 2 p.m which should give you time if you go you know, to the tent now, follow people if you uh, uh, don't know, that's you know, just follow. Um, uh, just a couple quick words about this evening to, to, so you can be thinking about this in terms of workshops and performances. We have an um, amazing film screening that some of you are signed up for already of Jonathan Hollander and Battery Dance's Moving Stories. We've shifted the location of that just to make it a more comfortable viewing experience because it's, it's, uh, it's got uh, lovely demand and interest from this building to another building on campus. It's the Intercultural Center ICC Auditorium. It's actually very nearby, um, but we want to make you aware of that in case you're coming from somewhere else. And we'll um, have people to direct you from dinner, f at the, from the um, tent at dinner, uh, if you're, there'll be one group going there, but I wanted to say that it's there. And the other thing, just to be aware of, there's a small number of you who are signed up for both that and um, Pascal Armand's um, Shithole Country Clapback next door. Those are gonna run into each other just a little bit because of demand, so you can go to Moving Stories, but you would have, if you need to make it back, you would have to leave the screening uh, just a little bit early. There's only, uh, I think, we think a small number of you have overlap, um, and that's just because of 
I pledge allegiance coming later in the evening and just the range of things we have. There will be a discussion at the screening also. Um, so we want to you know, wanted you to coordinate that, but just to sort of make you aware. There are still a small number of seats available for Shithole Country Clapback. What is really helpful because we're getting demand for all these performances is if you're changing your mind and you're on a list and you're not going to attend that performance to let us know because we have wait lists and it frees people up. So just if you can be communicating that. Does that make sense? Questions, ask us. Um, great.